Anyone else glad that you're here this morning? Yeah. 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 We take our, our first slide up and I want to, want to just uh, read a, a story. This is not, not our own family, but it, um, uh, because someone else has actually done the story using the names within their family, I thought oh, I'll, I'll actually use their um, story directly without um, changing it. But this could have been repeated in your family. And you may have been either the child or the adult, in this case the father. Daddy, little hand patted my, my forehead. I opened my eyes, which just happened to be trained on the digital clock in our room. 2.45. Now that would be AM, judging by the fogginess in my head. Yeah, Todd. Daddy, I need to go to the bathroom. Todd was just five years old at the time. I'm Todd. Thanks for the update. <laughs> Bathroom was at the other end of the house, down a dark hallway. When you're five years old, it looks like it's about five kilometers long, with multiple side rooms in which monsters and wild animals are just waiting for some poor little kid to pass by. Remember those days? <laughs> Todd dutifully shuffled out my door a few steps down the hallway, realized that the hallway was getting even darker as he walked. And what was that noise? What was the shadow? Was something moving? He quickly turned around and shuffle, shuffle back. And, yeah, Todd, why don't you come with me? Uh, thanks for the invitation, Todd, that I'm tired for some reason. You go ahead, don't let me stop you. Shuffle, shuffle, stop. Turn around, shuffle back. And, <laughs> yes, Todd, I really think you should come with me. Are you scared? No, I just want you to walk with me, Dad. I just want you to walk with me. Okay. Jumped out of bed, we walked down the hall together. I know there are times when people go through situations where they just want someone to walk down the hallway with them. They just want someone to just be there with them. It hopefully is not a situation exactly the same as the one described in our story. But it, it, <laughs> it may be a financial trauma that you go through, it may be a relationship breakdown, it may be uh, a change in life circumstance, maybe, uh, it, you know, there are just a whole myriad of different things that people go through where they, they, they want someone who is just going to be there with them. They, they just want and just need to know that someone is going to be there with them. When the Bible says God is spirit in, in John chapter 4, what it's saying is that God is in his presence everywhere. We theologically use the term omnipresence and it just means that, that God's presence is just everywhere. Last week I talked about God's knowledge, his, his complete and full knowledge. And this morning I want to, want to talk about uh, the fact that he's a God who's right there with you. Uh, the fact that he is everywhere. Wherever we are, he is already there. <laughs> God can't be confined because of his spirit to any one area. Um, I can't say because God is with me, he's not with Shelley. I, I can't say because God's with me, he's not with Tanya. No, he's not. I can't, I can't say that because God is spirit. So God is never going to be confined to one small material area. But to get away from the idea of pantheism, the, um, the uh, uh, pantheon teaches that because God is everywhere, God is in everything. So uh, I've got dirt outside, I've got rocks outside, and God is in them. I've got, I've got trees outside and leaves and butterflies and birds, and God is in all those things. So I can talk to God in the trees, I can talk to God in the stones, I can talk to God in the sand. And you understand where, where when we understand um, uh, God being everywhere, it's, I'm not thinking down this way. In a very real sense, God's presence is everywhere, but we use this other term, His essence. The essence of the Father, the um, essence of the, 
of the, the Son, the essence of the Father is in heaven, though the Father's presence is everywhere. The essence of the Son is in heaven, though its presence is everywhere. And it may just be a theological thing, but I, I just noticed, and, and uh, it's interesting how like Facebook brings this to the fore. You can put up something that you think has only one meaning, and then someone who you don't even know who they are is suddenly putting up a whole lot of stuff saying why it's rubbish and why and this happened to me yesterday and then someone else who i didn't know came to my defense i just sat back and watched these two have a bunk fight on my facebook and the thing went on and, on and i thought well it looks like it's finally come to a to a i didn't know who any of these people were they, they're just having their own theological bunk fight on my on my my, my facebook page but uh, but god's presence is everywhere even if his essence the father's essence is in heaven his presence is is everywhere um, i grew up in a denominational church and uh, through those years that i was growing up in that church i thought that because i was in church life i honestly thought that i was therefore a christian and i was not surrounded by people who had testimonies about what they were like before and then when when uh, they put their faith in Christ, how that changed them. Uh, I, I didn't hear stories like that. So I, I, I honestly thought we were all in the same boat. And, and part of this was that I believed in God's existence. I, I, I believed that, that God existed. And I thought, well, everything's based on my performance. And if I, I do the right thing, then, then that means God will like me in some way. And if I do the wrong thing, I, well, well, God probably won't like me. But, but these are all, and, and as I, I think about this, and I think about how many nominal uh, uh, Christians uh, hold to this, this is the same kind of basic belief system that Islam holds to. They believe that there's a, a God, they will use the name Allah for him, and they believe that, that everything is based on our performance. So really, the, the, uh, the, the basic two tenets that I held to before I actually was converted, before I became a Christian, were the basic two tenets of religions outside of Christianity. But when I did become a Christian, in my last year of high school, and it was completely unexpectedly, because I didn't even know what con conversion was. But, but in that experience, I suddenly found that this God who I believe existed out there, and that, that I simply had to try to do the right thing to, to, to keep him happy and keep him off my back, I guess, in, in some way, I suddenly found that this God, when, I, when, when Christ came into my life, when, when, when I put my faith in him, and I honestly and truly believe that when he went to the cross, he died for me. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ came and, and came and indwelled me, that began a relationship. And, it, and this relationship uh, completely changed something in me because when you, when you begin a relationship with someone, if that relationship is going to continue, it means that something has to change. I mean, just think back, perhaps when you're a, a, a teenager and, and you had a, had a boyfriend or a girlfriend or it was coming into that kind of relationship situation. I mean, if you never talked to them, if you never said hello to them, what would happen to that relationship? Well, it would probably last even shorter than most of them last these days for most teenagers what I see. But, but if there's a relationship, and, and for me when that relationship with God began, I, I suddenly realized this relationship had to be continued, that, that, that it was not just believing that God was out there and believing that I had to perform in a certain way to keep this God off my back, but that this was a personal God. A personal God, and so there, there had to be a personal relationship. There had to be a personal relationship. So my, my conversion changed things quite dramatically. Having a relationship with God, though, isn't like any other relationship. I mean, I think probably like, you know, when we're, when we're little kids, it's kind of in interesting, and, and we've um, looked after uh, grandkids for uh, a number of years, uh, just one, one day each week, and, and, and watching how when they're really young, even though they play 
together, they don't really play together, they just play and they happen to be together but they're playing different games and then you watch somewhere between four, five, six, somewhere in there that changes and, and, and it grows where the kids begin to play together. So there actually, there's actually a relationship forming, and then, and then I've already alluded to perhaps teenage years when, when uh, boyfriend girlfriend relationships begin. Uh, perhaps think back to the early stages of the person that you marry, and the uh, relationship and the growth of that relationship. And think to uh, think to situations where there may have been people that you haven't seen for a very long time, and it's been uh, just a, a, a personal joy to me in the last probably um, 12 months or so to uh, probably touch base and catch up with um, eight, nine, ten people that I've had no contact with for anything up to 30, 40 years and to actually track them down. I was on the phone yesterday for an hour and a half to uh, a couple that I, I knew a long time back and I've, I've not seen now for, for probably about 35 years. And it's, it's just, it's been a joy to, to catch up with, with these people. Even one of my Bible college lecturers I've, I've, I've caught up with uh, in the last two or, th or three weeks or so, uh, all via Facebook. So Facebook isn't entirely evil, mostly, but not entirely. <laughs> So, so these are all relationships, but yet our relationship with God is different to any of these, isn't it? Because these relationships will all come and go, but the relationship we have with God will be entirely different. But they do tell us something, and, and they tell us that we as human beings were made for relationship. God put that in us because He wanted us to find relationship with Him. So, so the fact that we grow up and we go in and out of different kinds of relationships is, uh, speaks to me that God put something in there because He wants people on earth to relate to, to Him. Not just to say, well, I believe God exists, but to come into a personal relationship that, uh, that I've described that began with my own conversion. Now, let's go a slightly different way. I'm thinking of... King David. I'm going to be looking in a moment at Psalm 139, which is where we were last week. The King David, Israel's greatest king ever. One day he lusted after another man's wife. He took a woman, they had sex, she fell pregnant. When he realized she was pregnant, he connived to have her husband killed on the battlefield. Now, perhaps as we read stories like this, you, uh, the thought may go through our mind, you know, what was David thinking? I mean, you know, was he kind of thinking no one sees behind closed doors? Did he have this male mentality thing that, that, um, that a, a man's mind is made up of all these rooms? And like a man can take something and he can put it in a room, as it were, in his mind, close a door, and then go on through his day as if it never happened. I've heard of different situations where a, uh, where a couple have a fight in the morning. Now, you've never had a fight with a partner, so you don't understand this, but they, they have a fight with their partner in the morning. The man goes out into a work situation. Women have in their mind one room. There's one room. And if you have a fight, you live and relive that fight all day. All day. This is what I could have said. This is what I should have said. Oh, if I had it again, I would have said this. Man, I would have slammed the door before he slammed. We go through. Men have all these rooms. Ah, oh, we had a fight. Whack it into a room. Shut the door. Go to work. He works through the day. Ah, oh, I might come back to him every now and then, but it's locked away. He comes home. He's happy. He's worked. And what happens when he opens the door and says, Honey, I'm home or something like that. <laughs> what is she? She's got this one room and it's been going through her mind. So she immediately goes back into it and he said, that's right, we had a fight before we left this morning, didn't we? Now I don't think King David did it quite like that. But I do recognize that men compartmentalize things in their minds. So they don't, they don't necessarily live and relive that whole thing over and over and over. So if you do have a, a Bible with you, I'd love you to turn with me to Psalm 139. The Psalm that we looked at some, uh, some part of last week and, and I just want to take up the next section of it. Last week we talked about God knowing everything. 
This week, we want to talk about God's presence being, being everywhere for us. So I just want to pick this up in, in verse 7. So David is writing, it's the Psalm of David. And he writes this, he says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? You know, like um, today, it might be, you know, some guy is on a, on a um, business trip. He, you know, he's away from home. He's he normally, you know, uh, normally involved with church life, but he's away. And, you know, he thinks, look, I'll just go down the pub or go down the club or whatever. And, you know, meet some woman down there and she's a bit drunk. And, and he gets a, a bit drunk and one thing leads to another. And he thinks, look, I'm far away from home, so what's it going to matter anyway? I mean, no one's going to know about these things. But David would say, where can I go from God's presence? Where? There's, there's nowhere that I can, I can go. Uh, nowhere. Verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Uh, uh, people watching stuff on, on screen that they know they shouldn't be watching. And, and, and just thinking, it's alright. You know, I look around. No, one, no one's watching me. I'll hear if anyone comes in. I tell you, someone's watching. Someone's presence is right there with you. <laughs> Where can I go from your spirit? How can I escape from your presence? So David found there was nowhere he could go. He might have looked to the left and to the right and thought there are no guards around, no one's watching. And if I just summon uh, uh, Bathsheba up, no one will know the background to it. No one will know what's, what's going on. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go? The spirit of God, the presence of God. He looks left and right. No one's watching, but the Holy Spirit is there. Come down to verse 11. And verse 11 says this, If I say, surely the darkness will hide me. The light has become night around me. Even the darkness will be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now, now in, in all this stuff, it, it probably makes it sound like I'm saying, oh, you know, God is like a policeman. The Spirit of God is watching over your shoulder for every little thing you do. How many know there's a certain truth to that? A certain truth. I was coming home from um, late on a Friday night from meeting someone down at uh, Browns Plains, another pastor going through a really um, tough time down, down that way. And, and um, coming back, and as I'm coming up at the, uh, uh, the uh, motorway, Logan Motorway, and then there's a part where it goes from, from 100 to 80, and where two lanes become one, you know that type of part. And, uh, and I'm just breezing along, and, and suddenly there are three police cars just there. And I think it's too late to actually try to slow down. I'm just going just gonna to sail on through, and I, I quickly look down at my speedo, and I'm amazed I'm actually doing 80. <laughs> I'm actually amazed, and I thought, I've probably done that trip so often, but I thought, I'm not going to slow down, I'm just going to cop it sweet, whatever it is. And I'm watching the policeman watching me as I'm watching them. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how come none of you have got your cameras out? Not quite sure what was going on, but there were three police cars there. But hey, what I am saying is this, that God cares enough to hold you to account. Now, I, now, I'm glad I'm married to someone who holds me to account. I'm glad. I'm glad that Teresa doesn't think, oh, you know, Jeff, well, he's just, he's just like the angels of God. Yes. <laughs> but he just couldn't do anything wrong. So, you know, I don't have to check anything. I don't have to ask him out. I don't have to, you know, he's, a, he's so holy. I have a wife who knows I'm not. And so she does, in that sense, hold me to account. I have jokes about this, and um, uh, I don't watch much, much TV, not because I think TV is evil or bad or anything. I just, I just find other things that I think are better to do. And um, but, but sometimes I'll, I'll finish up about nine, nine and watch half, half an hour of TV. Sometimes I turn the TV on, everything's fine until Teresa walks into the room, and then suddenly a sex scene comes on, <laughs> and she looks at it and she says. What are you watching? <laughs> it's happened, hasn't it? <laughs> and I said, that's the first one. <laughs> oh, is it now? Is it now? <laughs> I said, yes, yes, yes. 
But hey, look, I want to be held to account. I want God to hold me to account. I want my wife to hold me to account. I, I, I'd rather that, that if something is a little a little strange, a little doesn't quite fit, she says, can you explain this? Can you tell me about this? Rather than a situation where something grows and grows and you're wondering, and I wonder what it means. But I want you to know that God's spirit you cannot get away from. And even though uh, uh, said this first part of this little bit of Psalm 139 makes it sound like he's just a divine policeman going after you. I want you to know that he loves you so dearly that he will hold you to account. Um, recently we had done... Uh, how many of you love pigeons? How many, love, how many of you have a tin roof? How many of you... All right, let's put these things together. How many have a tin roof, love pigeons, and have at least 10 <laughs> nesting on your tin roof? I'm the only one. Oh, two. Oh, and you have solar panels. I'm the only one. So they're all underneath. And you know, they, they come home to roost about sunset. And... What they do, they put these little metal boots on. <laughs> and then they walk up and down in fire. <laughs> the whole ten of them. And then they're sort of quiet during a lot of the night. And then about four o'clock in the morning, they say, time to put the boots on. And so they put the boots back on. And they walk up and down, up and down till about eight o'clock or so. Then they go off somewhere, and by that stage, you're just wide awake anyway. It doesn't work. Wide awake hours before then. So, so we decided to do something about this. We looked at different things you can do to um, stop pigeons. You know, uh, uh, someone from this fellowship kindly told me about these um, a little uh, uh, pill things you can give them that that make them go weird and, and crazy. And I thought, yep, that'd be good, weird boy. <laughs> like having ten normal ones is bad enough. Imagine ten crazy ones up there. No, you want that. Someone else said, you know, you can, you can still buy slug guns. I thought, no, what if I miss and shoot a neighbour? You know, I have memories of walking to a school as a, as, as a kid, primary school, and being shot by kids with um, slug guns. Um, there are times we would not walk one way because there was a kid up in the house. He'd sit there on the veranda shooting at anyone walking by with a slug gun. Uh, remember a mate getting hit just under the eye. So I thought, no, don't, don't want to do that. So we, we finished up getting what to, turned out to be a, a, a kind of a, a, a little bit expensive thing. And, and, um, but just to um, stop these uh, pigeons, not to kill them, but just say, please go to a, to, to a neighbour's home. Our <laughs> next door neighbour, they have solar panels. Um, and, and they have, and they're so lovely, they're nice people. They're the ones who have the, the, the water trough out the front for all of you pigeon guys and girls. So, you know, you, you go over there. We, we just encourage them really, really nicely. But when I went to uh, pay for it, and uh, I, was, I was paying cash, and, the, and I just said to the guy, I said, look, I'm paying cash. He said, oh, paying cash. Oh, well, that, that, that'll be less. And I said, is there a discount? He said, no, no, there's just no... GST. Well, I said, well, there is GST. He said, well, I won't pay it. I just won't um, tell them. Oh, I'm thinking, oh, great. <laughs> so I said, no, I want to pay the whole amount and I want a receipt for it too. And he said, oh, wow, kind of like pure weird. You know, I mean, it, because the, the GST was over $100. So it's a substantial difference. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at this, this whole thing and, and, and I'm wanting for, uh, for, for him to kind of say something really, really. Uh, and he said, oh, he said, oh, I guess I should be careful. I, I, I offer that to everyone. One day I'm going to meet someone who works for the taxation office. I thought, well, I've met someone else who looks after the taxation office. His name is Jesus. But anyway, um, I, and, and all I could say was, I said, I love having a clear conscience. That's all I could say to him. And I thought, I'm waiting for him to say something more. But he was too embarrassed by, by that stage. He wasn't going to say, Oh, I fall on my knees before you. You are a holy man of God, like your wife used to think you were once. But, but, but you know, none of this stuff happened. He was just embarrassed, finished the job, 
Forgot to turn the power back on to the solar panels. I couldn't work out why we got no power after he left, thinking he's, he's done something wrong. Looked at the power box and thought he didn't even turn them back on. He said, I'd like to clean up everything. And he cleaned up about half of it and we found a whole lot of stuff that he didn't clean up. But never mind. But the issue was this. What if he turned up here this morning? Now, what if I said, oh, yeah, I want to save that 100 bucks too. I don't want to pay, pay that. I mean, the Australian government's got enough money, hasn't it? No. Well, no, that's not what I hear day in and day out. But anyway, so, so but what if he had turned up here? What if he's listening to, I know that guy is rich, yeah. He's the one who, he's the one who wouldn't, he's the one who helped me and worked in with me so we could get extra money and keep it from the taxation department. And he's telling me that Jesus, can change. his life hasn't been changed. So how can Jesus change my life if Jesus hasn't changed it? Can you see why having a clear conscience is a really good thing? You see why, why, why situations where you may get away with all kinds of stuff, but the Spirit of God is still there. The Spirit of God is still there. Verse 8. David writes this in Psalm 139. If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So, so he's not now talking about God being like a policeman. He's now talking about some of the benefits of the fact that, that God's presence is everywhere he is. Um, how many of you have ever been on the, on the giant drop at Free World? Oh. Right, let me just come back to the last part of verse 10 before we get to the giant drop. Those of you on the giant drop, you just wait there, please. Right up the top. But verse 10, even there your hand will guide me. Then this part, your right hand will hold me fast. Your right hand will hold me fast. So what David is saying is, God's hand holds his hand. That's what he's saying. Your right hand will hold me fast. So it's God's hand holding his hand. God's hand holding his hand. All right, you still back up on the up on the drum drop. Uh, one time, Teresa and Shane were doing the uh, giant drop. I think I either wasn't there or I was holding the bags down the bottom. <laughs> Not quite my cup of tea, I'm afraid. I don't remember. I remember Shane got a bit knocked around by it, though. But um, it is the still the, the world's longest vertical freefall drop. And at times you reach 135 kilometers an hour on the way down. <laughs> and you see how people just love it and how they're all... Can you see this lady's hair in the middle? That is her hair going right up there. <clears throat> because they're coming down. And, and so Teresa and Shane are, are, are on this giant drop. And there's some teenage kid, a uh, teenage boy just on the other side who doesn't know who this, who this person is. So you get right up the top, and then as this thing is falling down, this teenage boy who she doesn't know beside her suddenly grabs her hand. I don't know what that is. And she's thinking, what are you doing? I don't think he was kind of, you know, banging on to her. I think, I think he was just terrified. <laughs> And I think if I was on the giant drop, I'd grab both hands on either side. I don't care if they're 121-year-old grandmas. I'd be grabbing their hands and holding on for grim death. Here God says, I will hold your hand. Even there your hand will guide me, verse 10. Your right hand will hold me fast. Your right hand will hold me fast. So we, we do. We serve a God who holds our hand, no matter what we go through. Um, Psalm 34 and verse 18, we used to sing this. The Lord, what we say, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, saves those who are crushed in spirit. Near to the brokenhearted. He's not a wrong way away from them. 
You may go through things that you think, man, no one knows what I'm going through. I, I just don't feel, you know, no one feels what I'm feeling. No, I can't talk to anyone to explain what's going on, the sense of brokenness inside me. God, you seem far away from me. You know what God says? He said, I am near to the broken heart. He said, if you're broken hearted, he said, I'm near to you. I'll come. I'll hold your hand in the midst of the things that you're going through. I mentioned about um, having an hour and a half phone call with someone um, uh, yesterday. And uh, in, an, in an email from them, and uh, uh, this man's wife is uh, battling cancer and, and uh, he's uh, just, he's got a health con concerns too on the other side and had to have a, a very difficult hospital procedure through the week. His wife had a, a massive back spasm the night before. They're trying to work out was she even able to uh, drive him uh, because he had been partly sedated. He wasn't allowed to drive and they're trying to work all this out. And in an email to me, he said this. He said, uh, he said, there was extra stress associated with my wife's circumstances, but she was able to drive me there and back. It took a lot out of us both, but God has given the strength to endure. When I talked with him, the word grace kept coming out in the conversation over and over and over and over. Grace, grace, grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Um, some of us have small fears. Um, some of us have big fears. Um, over the last six years, I've had, I've, I've had three um, health scares. Um, two that... Uh, you know, I, I, I talked to the doctor straight and said, well, could this be a cancer? And twice, um, twice he said yes. And then uh, one time with a um, heart, I had what to me was a heart, heart attack. I had all the, the, the tingling down the, the arm. I had everything. And all they could find was a murmuring heart. And murmuring's bad, isn't it? <coughs> so I thought, I've got a bad, evil, wicked heart. I need Jesus. <laughs> But, but in the midst of these things, and in the, and look, look at really, yeah, it would be lovely if I, uh, if I could have said, man, I don't care, devil, throw at me whatever you like. Is that the best you can do? Come on, take another punch. I'll give you one. I'm not, not like that. Can I suggest you don't be like that either? Because, you know, when the devil punches, when you don't guard yourself, he really hurts. He really, really hurts. But, but I am saying this. If any of those situations had turned out to be more serious than they finished up being. And hey, here I am, still here. <laughs> still here. I know that God would have held my hand through. I, I know that no matter what I had gone through, God would be holding my hand. So would my wife. <laughs> They walk back on the, on the big giant drop, and you're a little bit older than that teenager, but that she would be hold, but she would be holding my hand too. Psalm, the psalm we, we have just read, 100 and, what is it, 139 verse, verse 10. His right hand holding us, his right hand holding us. Um, some of you have fears uh, because of specific things. Uh, some of you just from time to time have fears because things just just come up um, and I, I really believe that God loves to deal with, with fears bit by bit when I was young I had a, a very strong fear of heights it was really extreme um, anyone recognize this building that goes up into the clouds Q1 Q1 used to be the highest residential building in the world now it's only the second highest because someone built one much, much higher. Recently, we, um, we were visiting some, some folk down there and they were staying at um, Q1. Uh, Q1 had 71 floors. Now, they went up on the 71st floor. But I tell you what, they were in a, uh, a call it a suite that was larger than our home. Huh. It was massive. It was massive. And someone just gave it to them for a week's holiday without them paying for it. I have no idea how much it would be. I'm assuming it would be thousands of dollars normally. Right down one side were these just windows. And the, and the view from where they were, and as I said, they went right up the top. But the uh, view 
was not altogether different from what this, what you see. This is someone, uh, people just climbing up toward the top part. This is how high that jolly building is. So when you're looking at, and I'm looking out these windows and thinking, man, I'm glad these windows are all firmly shut. They're right down the entire side. And you're looking down, there are even clouds. There are small clouds coming around there, around the, around the part of the building. And then the five-year-old son of the folk that we're uh, just visiting down there, the uh, dad's over near the windows. He said, oh, the window's open. So he opens them right up. The windows are about this high. There are no grills. There are no bars. There's nothing. They go right down the side of the unit. And as I said, the unit, the suite, is larger than our home. It is massive. And the five-year-old, I'm watching him running toward the open window. And I tell you what, he might be five, but he can get up speed. And something inside me just said, Jesus, like do something. And then his dad puts a hand out and said, and said, you're not allowed to, what do you say, you're not allowed to jump up or not allowed to. <laughs> not in front of your mother. Yeah, that's right, not in front of your mother. <laughs> From, from that height. Not in, I mean, that's just a real wise Christian dad. A real wise Christian dad. You know, there can be longer term fears that we have that we still need to bring before God. Uh, my own fear of heights, I have many, many, many times prayed about. Brought before God and say, God, no matter what I go through, your hand is with me. You hold my hand. Your presence will never leave me. And I need to know that. And then I, I've asked him, and even knowing I was going to be sharing this little story this morning, I asked him again. Yesterday I said, God, you know this whole fear of heights thing, I really want you to deal with that. Um, but I get up on our, on our roof and, and wander around and chase pigeons up until recently. You now they chase me. But um, it, it's, it's like it's so much better than it ever used to be. But I want to encourage you that no matter what the fears are, no matter what, what you've been through in the past, what you're going through now, or what you will go through, Psalm 139 says that the Spirit...